there, there is somebody who does not use his hand, who hides it from view because of what we did or failed to do. We should not forget such patients. They should stand beside us while we plan treatment for others. They should look over our shoulders at surgery and be with us at therapy sessions and whisper reminders to be gentle and warnings to stop and think. Then it goes on. Any major surgery on the hand needs to be a joint enterprise between the surgeon, the patient and the therapist. There may be surgeons who prefer to be therapists as well, but they need to discipline themselves to spend a lot of extra time with the patients. They will probably learn, at least when they get busier, that not only will they be able to treat more patients, but also the job will be done better if the responsibilities are shared. Every therapist is taught to respect and to support the surgeon's opinion and prescriptions. Not all surgeons are taught that an experienced therapist has an opinion that is valuable and should be listened to with respect. Both surgeon and therapist should listen to the patient at every stage and demonstrate a willingness to be flexible and responsive to each other and to the patient. Every improvement of strength and mobility is a mutual triumph and a cause for mutual celebration. The most important member of the team is the patient. Most of us professionals do not take the patient seriously enough into our confidence, nor do we recognize his or her competence and value in the restoration of health and mobility. The most important variable in the patient is his or her psychological makeup and attitude. A hand is a very personal thing, and I think we could say this for just about all parts of the body. It is the interface between the patient and his or her world. It is an emblem of strength, beauty, skill, sexuality, and sensibility. When it is damaged, it becomes a symbol of vulnerability of the whole patient. The first responsibility of hand therapists and hand surgeons is not to build up their own image of competence, but to encourage the patient, make him feel good about himself, and change his fear into confidence. A family of opossums live near my home in Louisiana. If a dog or person frightens one of them at night, it goes at once into a rigid catatonic state. It becomes stiff and immobile from snout to tail and stays that way until we go away and it is no longer afraid. There are patients who are a little like that. We have learned to recognize the type and to be cautious about them because their hands easily become stiff, their eyes are wide and they follow our, all our movements. Their hands are often cold and they are reluctant to be tested. Such patients need time to gain confidence. It is good to hold their hand gently while you talk and explore the history of their problem. It is good just to stroke their hand and it is good to be unhurried and ask about the family and the home and to appreciate their good qualities and the way that they have faced their problems. It is necessary to emphasize very early on that you, the surgeon or the therapist, are not going to make decisions for the patient. It is his or her hand. Any remaining good muscles, good joints, good sensation should be noted appreciatively. Gradually the hand will become warmer and will relax and early signs of confidence and hope will appear. All this time spent on developing mutual understanding and trust is not time lost. It is time saved from the post-operative period. When you've made friends with an opossum, it does not go rigid, and the same is true of the hand. We do not really understand why a whole hand may become stiff after minor and localized surgery, but we do know that it happens more often and more severely when there is pain and anger and fear and a sense of helpless frustration. It happens less when there is hope and trust and confidence and the patient has a sense that he or she is competent and in control. And that's what I think I would like to do. I'd like to feel I had such a relationship. I know I fall far short of that thing sometimes and I know I sometimes get tied up with the sort of mechanism of the manipulation when it's really just part of what we do in terms of our whole understanding as healers of this patient. I really like to think to myself that this was a way that I looked at patients and this is something I think that I would like to attain. I'd like to thank you very much for the opportunity of coming this week. We've got through the week very safely.
That's a compliment to you and also, I suppose, to some of the things that I have taught you as well. But it's this whole understanding and the way that you've conducted yourself in this group that's been very good. Of course, it's my pleasure to thank um, Anne and Chris. It's been a, a great pleasure and, and it's been a luxury for you to have three of us teaching so that there's not been a time lag between when we could all go around. Dave, I don't know who else helped you with all this, but that's been absolutely fantastic. It makes such a difference to have that kind of variety and informality, and it's the whole thing. And I'd like to thank you very much for the tables. It's made a huge difference to the way that we've been able to do our specific techniques. And at least we've felt a table that is solid when we got it into different positions. So, I'd like to thank you for coming, I'd like to wish you luck, and I know that you'll put these principles into operation, and that we are going to go ahead, and we're going to go forward, and we're going to sort of be proud of the group that we belong to. And I think that's what matters, because patients out there need some of our help. Thank you very much.